Hello and welcome back. <laughs> um, I have to keep remembering this is a class, not a sitcom. So I have to remember that. Last week, uh, we talked about the war at home, the domestic impact, the domestic consequences of the Vietnam War. And we talked about how um, Vietnam, a foreign war, transformed American society at home so dramatically. Uh, how it gives rise to a mass anti-war movement, how it um, takes a civil rights movement which is already um, active and has achieved some great success and essentially shifts attention away from civil rights, from domestic programs like the Great Society toward the Vietnam War. So for the government, Vietnam becomes uh, the obsessive event of that administration, of the Johnson administration. They have to spend more money and time on Vietnam to the uh, detriment of other issues, of other causes and for uh, civil rights advocates or people who are concerned about poverty, they too have to focus attention away from their particular cause toward the war, uh, in many cases opposing, toward opposing the war, because they see, just like LBJ, the Vietnam War becoming the dominant national issue. And of course, the, the dominant figure, I think, in this convergence between the war and social forces is Martin Luther King. And as a, as a, uh, a document, his April 4, 1967 speech, which is in the reader, I think really speaks to these issues with a great deal of clarity. You also see a women's movement emerge out of that, out of the anti-war movement. Uh, later on, the environmental movement and, and uh, gay rights movements will uh, often adapt many of the tactics used by the new left in the anti-war movement. So all of these things come tied together. There's also a cultural aspect, a cultural impact of Vietnam, which I'm going to talk about very briefly. I'd hoped to spend more time on it at the beginning of the semester, and I had wanted actually to come and bring in music of that period, music connected to the Vietnam War, but wasn't able to get copyright stuff um, uh, authorization on it. And that's fine, because the way we're going, I'd really kind of rather try to get through this uh, a little more uh, quickly than we often do. But I'm not going to rush through it, and of course, we can discuss stuff and have questions as well. Um, but I want to talk a little bit today about what's referred to as the counterculture. Uh, obviously, a counterculture exists um, in opposition or in juxtaposition, or, or especially in this case, opposition to the dominant culture. Uh, the dominant culture uh, is perceived to be uh, uh, a culture at that time of uh, uh, establishment, white men who uh, tend to have power either in government or in business. Uh, it is a culture which younger people in opposition to it will say was responsible for a war in Vietnam, was responsible for southern segregation. Uh, they will see a culture of conformity, uh, a culture which uh, takes as its birthright uh, the right to intervene in other people's lives or in other lands. So a counterculture will emerge in response to that. Now the counterculture precedes the Vietnam War. You can trace it back to the beatniks of the 1950s. I mean, and even before that, there have always been countercultures. There have been people who lived outside the mainstream, who dress differently, act differently, talk differently. Uh, instead of drinking martinis, they may have uh, smoked marijuana, they may have smoked dope. So there have always been countercultures. And the counterculture of the Vietnam era is probably the best known, but I would argue that's because it's been so successfully commodified that it's been kind of brought into the system as a way to sell goods, to make movies, to make TV shows so successfully. But I'm not sure that it really, when it was occurring, was that dramatically different than, let's say, the counterculture of the 1920s, which in its own way had a powerful impact on American society, jazz, bathtub gin, shorter skirts, and that kind of stuff, changing sex roles and, and whatnot. So I'm not sure that Vietnam, the 60s counterculture, was that much more pronounced, but clearly it's had more of a legacy and impact because advertising and the media is so much more powerful now than it would have been in the 1920s or 30s. Um, among people of that time, at the time the counterculture was emerging, there was a debate uh, that goes on today about what its basis was, the reason behind its existence, what it meant, and uh, what its importance was. And a lot of people, obviously, there are myriad ideas about what it meant, but in general, I think the two more important ones are uh, there are some people who would claim that the counterculture was basically hedonistic, individualistic. It was people who had their own personal pleasure uh, uh, in question, and they were trying to find ways to you know, kind of express that. There's another point of view, one to which I actually uh, agree, which finds it as a political statement. I don't want to say movement because that implies kind of levels of organization and stuff like that that didn't exist. I mean, it's not a... a, a 
an organized movement with you know groups and meetings and stuff like that. Uh, but there are, but but I do see it as a, as having a, a political meaning, making a political statement. Uh, so even though it may have uh, taken place, or it may have been demonstrated, or people may have played it out in personal ways, or in ways that may have seemed apolitical, and clearly, people in the counterculture can be apolitical. I would argue that in general, it really spoke to political issues, and that it spoke especially to the Vietnam War. Part of my larger um, idea that Vietnam becomes the transformative event of that period, I would argue that it, it does so culturally too. Uh, when the Vietnam War begins, uh, it's a period of, uh, of uh, youthful optimism. Kennedy, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Uh, a period where clearly old ways are breaking down. Uh, the birth control pill had been uh, discovered in 1960, so sexual habits are already changing. Uh, parietals in many colleges are beginning to change, but by and large, uh, uh, and, and by and large, the old 50s type, you know, kind of leave it to beaver, fathers knows best, family is changing, but by and large you do see a continuum, and all of a sudden you see a fairly significant shift by the middle 1960s, and I would argue that, uh, uh, although it's already occurring because of things like civil rights, Vietnam really is the major uh, a point, uh, a break point in that, in that period. Um, as I said, um, well, to kind of get, get to the next point here, the, the key, I think, to all this is the idea uh, that people now will question authority far more comfortably than they ever had before. Uh, there is a credibility gap, to use a later phrase. Uh, there have always been Americans, especially younger people, who questioned whether the way that their parents or professors or political leaders were telling them to do things was the right way. That's typical, I mean, that's unavoidable. You will always have people questioning authority. But at the same time, for most people, there was a, an overabiding faith that their parents and their teachers and the government would, in the end, probably do the right thing, or that at the very least, even if you worried about that, they deserve your respect, that they probably were being for the most part, on the up and up with you. Uh, there's a general sense that uh, a society is running fairly well, that bad things happen, but they're the result of bad people, like Bull Connor. So when you look at civil rights, you'll see Bull Connor or Jim Clark, and you see these kind of racist, redneck sheriffs that you couldn't even invent if you were in central casting in Hollywood, and you see them as the problem. But general, in general, Amer the American people are good. America's political leaders have the best interests at heart. That's the general attitude. Well. After Vietnam, people become very hardened, and they see quite clearly that the government isn't being straight with them in many cases, that there are clear cases where they're out and out lying. Gulf of Tonkin, a good example. And so you start to see a hardening of attitudes and a real questioning of authority far more than you ever did before. Again, not for the first time, and again, exacerbated because of the way it is kind of revealed because of the way it's narrated. Uh, but even so, this becomes really kind of a, a trademark of the movement. It's, it's, a, it's an opposition to the dominant culture, and people are questioning things now more than they ever did before. Do you want to say something, or I thought you were going to make a comment? I will. OK. I no <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, a, a quick litany of, of all the major things. Uh, uh, to do this you know, in a proper way would require reams of time. I, I actually have taught a course on the entire 60s where I get to go into this in some depth and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and, you know, you really can't do it in one day. So I'm going to kind of just kind of poke around in it, not really in any systematic way, and talk uh, impressionistically and feel free to, to chip in any time you want. Um, as I said, the counterculture doesn't emerge because of Vietnam. It actually has its roots. This, this particular counterculture we're talking about uh, in the beatnik movement of the 1950s, I think those are probably the, the most clear links. People like Ginsburg and Kerouac and Burroughs, who uh, especially took on the conformism, the conformity of the 1950s, the racial attitudes. Uh, uh, when you think of Ginsburg or Kerouac or, or, or Burroughs or uh, uh, Snyder or Ferlinghetti, I mean, you see in their poetry or in their, in their novels a real power a real sense of urgency that, that society has become too staid, uh, uh, too, too much the same. And so they're talking about uh, you know, racial mixing. Uh, uh, beats uh, are often associated with the jazz scene, which is really you know, kind of biracial. Black and white folks can go out together. Uh, beats are talking about casual drug use. 
So, uh, uh, you know, you kind of have a scene in your, in your head of people dressed in black at a coffee house, you know, smoking dope and listening to jazz while they snap their fingers or something like that. This is different. I mean, this is not, uh, you know, Di the Dinah Shore show, you know, with a bunch of, you know, clean cut white people in tuxedos and ballroom dresses or anything like that. So it's in opposition to that. The Beats, however, also have a very a strong political edge to them. Uh, if you've ever re read something like uh, Ginsburg's How, which uh, I think is probably the, the kind of paradigm for this entire period. I mean, Ginsburg's How, I, I probably should have brought it in just because it's kind of fun to read some parts of it. Uh, beyond this call for kind of a, a self-release, the idea that you're being, uh, you know, kind of repressed, that, that you, you have to be able to express yourself, whether it be sexually or, or, or in terms of drugs or in terms of spirituality or whatever. Beyond that, in how there's also a, a strong condemnation of conformity and capitalism, and Ginsburg later will become uh, essentially a usual suspect at every anti-war action. There are many people at the time who were uh, attacked and criticized, being limousine liberals, or or they were only along, you know, because their own popularity increased. Ginsburg, from everybody who ever knew him, was the real deal. Ginsburg. Uh, uh, was always willing, if his schedule permitted, to appear at an anti-war rally. He donated very generously of his time and of his money for the movement. Uh, and he was a fixture. Anytime there was a major rally, he would be there. Quite often he would be, you know, at one point he was meditating to try to end the war. I mean, it could take on, you know, a situation like that. Uh, but by and large, um, he uh, uh, combined these personal ideals with a strong political message, the idea that conformity and this kind of uh, uh, new society where everybody's kind of uh, manufactured. Uh, I read part of Mario Savio's talk last week. Uh, remember when he talks about the, when the operations of the machine become so odious, you have to throw yourself on the gears. One of the signs that the uh, free speech movement uh, used was, uh, um, you know, I'm a student, uh, not, a, not a computer card. Do not fold, spindle, or mutilate, something like that. So as we enter the computer age, there are people who are resisting it. And they see the Vietnam War as kind of a, a symptom of a much larger problem socially. So whereas some people would see, you know, George Wallace or Bull Connor as a bad man doing bad things, they would see it more kind of systemically. They would see this as a culture of conformity, a culture where people who challenge the system are, you know, uh, cast outside the mainstream. And so in beatniks, you really get the, the roots of what will later be uh, anti-war activity, and it's not all unusual. I mean, if you're a beatnik or a, or a hippie, uh, you're probably not going to be in favor of the war. That's, you know, probably fairly clear link there. Uh, hippies, you know, kind of emerge out of this movement. Uh, the term, you know, comes out of the hipster movement. Uh, people who hung out, you know, for example, in jazz clubs and smoked dope were often called hipsters. And beats and hipsters would mix together, and uh, uh, hippies kind of emerge out of that. Um, you know, what, what's a hippie? Uh, is it a way, you know, it could be a way of dress, uh, you wear your hair longer, it's, it's, it's a way of mind, uh, the way you think. Uh, you know, we all have the, the kind of stereotype in our head of somebody with long hair and uh, big bell bottoms and barefooted or maybe wearing sandals and a funky shirt and love beads on and all that kind of stuff. And it's become such a caricature, you know, it's, it's hard to even speak about without, you know, kind of chuckling and rolling your eyes dismissively. Uh, but in fact, this movement, too, emerges out of a particular political context. Uh, uh, people start to lose faith, as I said before, in the authority figures in their lives. Uh, and they start to think that maybe it isn't just bad men. Maybe all of them kind of have some kind of role in this. For a lot of people, the, the Kennedy assassination was really critical. It kind of shattered many of their disillusions. Uh, uh, they had really kind of invested their faith in JFK. And to see him, you know, you know, assassinated, slain, you know, so publicly really kind of shatters, I think, a lot of people's ideals and illusions about the system. Uh, and, of course, I think Vietnam really, you know, really does it because people start to see uh, the same people who are telling them what to wear and what to do and what to learn in school and uh, are, are also sending people to, to fight in Vietnam. Uh, you know, the, it may not be their parents specifically, but it's their parents kind of writ large, that generation. You know, think of the graduate. Uh, which is, even though it has, I don't think the word Vietnam is mentioned in the graduate, it's, it's about that generation, and you can kind of see that hanging over it. The idea there that uh, Dustin Hoffman, Ben, just doesn't want to mainstream himself into this. You know, he has an affair with his, you know, potential girlfriend's mother. Now, that 
may not be a political statement. I don't know. I have to uh, ask Mike Nichols about that. But, but clearly, it speaks to a, a much larger issue at the time. Easy Rider, same thing. The idea there is that, that, that uh, conformism has brought all kinds of bad stuff upon us. And we really need to find a different way to do things. Right? So hippies kind of speak to that. Um, people are scared. God, they're terrified. There are laws passed against particular dress codes. Um, you know, people are arrested for wearing their hair long and for, you know, wearing bell bottoms and basically looking like a hippie, that kind of thing. Um, you start to see this uh, uh, also become very prevalent in anti-war rallies. Uh, um, you know, the major events of, of hippiedom or of the, of, the, of the hippie ethic tended to also have a tie into the war. The Summer of Love, 1967, San Francisco, the Summer of Love, all right, as opposed to the Summer of War in Vietnam. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the cute little slogans of the day was, of course, make love, not war. Uh, every particular event, whether it be, you know, Timothy Leary, uh, guru of LSD, uh, tune in, turn on, drop out. Uh, uh, they, you know, Leary would be there, you know, speaking about the glories of LSD, but they would also be chanting mantras to end the war in Vietnam. So there's a real connection here, which is why I would argue that, you know, kind of this counterculture, especially things like hippies, were directly tied into the war. Now, there were probably, you know, clearly there were hippies who were just there to get stoned and probably couldn't tell you what Vietnam was or anything like that. But I think for the most part, there really was a convergence of these movements. On one hand, this attack on conformity, this sense that we need to release ourselves and have some fun. Uh, we need to, you know, express ourselves in terms of pleasure. And on the other hand, this, we don't want anything to do with a culture that's creating this war, that's going to war in Vietnam. I mean, sexual attitudes change as a result of that. Uh, as I said, I think I said last week, at, at anti-war rallies, one of the popular signs held by a woman was girls say yes to boys who say no. So it's a way of kind of tying these things in together. You know, premarital sex is a way to get your parents pissed off, so let's do it. And that's also a way to show our opposition to the war in Vietnam. Okay? So it's a political statement. And I'm sure no, no man on a college campus ever tried to to use that line on a woman. I'm sure it never happened in the 1960s. Um, so you start to see then, then all this um, occurring. It also reflects itself in kind of uh, entertainment and pop culture. Uh, music is the best example. I mean, the music of the Vietnam era is, is basically legendary. It's become the score now to every movie on the 1960s. Uh, uh, and again, it's become, I think, you know, co-opted and co commodified. Um, but even in, you know, in the earliest days, even before Vietnam, you started to see kind of this, this revival of folk, uh, which often had a political edge to it. Uh, probably, and obviously, Bob Dylan, the best known. Um, Phil Oakes, a folk singer, uh, actually in Ohio State, uh, almost an alum. Uh, he never graduated from there. But uh, Phil Oakes, uh, also uh, you know, a major figure in this period. Uh, it's a good book called The Folk Revival uh, by a guy named Robert Cantwell, which talks about this. Folk had been obviously quite popular. Uh, during the Depression in the 1930s, Woody Guthrie, probably the best known entertainer in America at the time, clearly one of the best. And in the late 50s, along with the Beatnik, you start to see a revival in folk music. Uh, Pete Seeger, um, the Weavers, groups like that. Uh, initially traditional folk, but becoming more and more political. And then Dylan, I think, really as much as anybody bridges this. Uh, Dylan, uh, you know, was really inspired by Guthrie, spends a good deal of time at Guthrie's bedside as he's dying. Uh, well, actually, he wouldn't die for quite some time, but uh, he was, he was uh, ill for, for a long time. Uh, Dylan goes to New York and spends time uh, at Woody Guthrie's bedside uh, and does more traditional stuff, but then quickly moves into other areas, uh, civil rights. A uh, song about Medgar Evers, a haunting song called Only a Pawn in Their Game, which he writes after Medgar Evers is uh, uh, killed. And uh, I think it debuts, actually, at the March on Washington in August of 63. It's the first time Dylan plays this publicly. He writes, uh, um, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Masters of War, obviously a song that has a good deal of meaning to me because I think it speaks to the whole issue of the military-industrial complex and the way American society is very militaristic. Uh, so Dylan is really going, uh, kind of going back to the type of stuff Woody Guthrie wrote. Guthrie was all, uh, very uh, uh, candid in his songs too. They weren't euphemistic. Guthrie would write songs about bankers and call them rapists and stuff like that. So Dylan is kind of going back to that and it really, it really sticks with people. And music becomes a major aspect of the movement. First, the Civil Rights Movement. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had its own uh, choir, the SNCC Singers, who would travel around and sing. They actually played with, Dylan would play with them occasionally. Joan Baez would play with them. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, and once Vietnam becomes a public issue, these folks become fixtures at just about every rally. Uh, Oaks, Dylan less so. Dylan was far more active in civil rights than he was in, in anti-war stuff. 
Uh, Phil Oaks very much involved, actually one of the founders of the Yippies. Peter, Paul, and Mary, Pete Seeger, Odetta, a folk singer. Uh, so music becomes part of the culture. Initially, it's kind of folk or derivative of folk. But, it, but, but rock becomes far more popular, especially when the war takes place. Um, I, I don't know if it's the first major kind of Vietnam-related song to hit the charts, but we'll go to heart rating. So when did uh, Eve of Destruction? So was that 1965? Okay, uh, in 1965, two of the most popular songs were the first by Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler, which was the, uh, the Bout of the Green Berets, Silver Wings Upon Their Chest. I'm not going to sing for you because this will be recorded forever. Um, and the other was Eve of Destruction by Barry McGuire, who, which was written by, McGuire didn't write it, it was some like 18-year-old kid or something like that who wrote that, I think, wasn't that it? Yeah. And uh, um, these were two of the more popular songs, and you couldn't have them further apart. Of course, the, the Bout of the Green Berets is a, kind of a traditional American you know, heroic song, and Eve of Destruction uh, really speaks to a lot of the issues that were going on at the time, uh, a war, uh, I don't think there's a specific reference to Vietnam in it. I'm kind of playing it through in my head. I uh, can't remember, but I don't think there is. But it talks about, uh, you know, war in the Middle East. It talks about uh, uh, Asia, you know, Red China, as, as they call it then. And it really has a fairly biting political message. <laughs> what? Those are like, you know, these narrative story songs in the uh, 1999, we have... We've gone from eve of destruction to everybody wear sunscreen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like what I think what happened in the, in with music and culture in the '60s was you had a couple of things. One, there was like this rip in the social fabric, mm -hmm. and through that rip, you could see the contradictions of the society with civil rights, with the war in Vietnam. This is what the United States professes to stand for. This is what's really happening, and kids, particularly young males, were eye to eye with that contradiction because they could get drafted and yeah. sent to Vietnam in a way that, that kids since then, those contradictions are still there, but n people aren't forced to confront them in the same way, yeah. perhaps. And I think because of that, you had a uh, culture that would normally be on the bohemian fringe. Like if Bob Dylan were to come along now, there's no way he would be on Top 40 radio. He would be a fringe character like mm -hmm. Phil Oaks, mm -hmm. you know, or like put into this Americana, you know, format type thing. Or Jimi Hendrix, you know, this black guy with wild hair playing psychedelic blues. There's no way he would get on the radio right. now, you know, unless he, you know. So um, you, uh, I think that was combined with the fact that you had this baby boom demographic there so that they found a way to market this stuff so that they could make money mass marketing stuff that would normally be uh, toward the fringe is why that, uh, why, you know, but I think that the awareness of that contradiction somehow spurred more inspired art, whether it was, you know, directly political or not. You had soul music, you had avant-garde jazz, you had this folk music, great cultural, you know, across the board uh, explosion of creativity. Um, as far as the, the political content, though, I think it's possible to kind of overstate it. I mean, a lot of it, I think, was pretty naive. You know, you have the Jefferson Airplane, got a revolution, got a revolution. You know, never quite happened. You know, like, and, and um, I'm always surprised when I, uh, you know, hear about, you know, people that were like old acid heads and they're now Republican judges in Oklahoma <laughs> City, you know, and, there, and yeah. you know, it, to it, there was a lot of it that was hedonistic and the politics were self-serving. I think, though, the, uh, the politics were, were almost kind of more um, uh, real on a, on a sim not a symbolic level, but an Im implicit level as opposed to explicit, you know, and a, a lot of what was... Uh, was uh, the the actual things that people said sometimes were not as uh, didn't go as deep as what they were what they were doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. I mean, you know, on one level, you're right. It, I actually agree with everything you say. You, you obviously know this stuff you know, uh, more clearly than I do, and it was naive. I mean, you know, the Jefferson Airplane singing, you know, about revolution doesn't going to make it happen. But at the same time, you know. 
you're right. The Vietnam and, and the other stuff going on creates openings, so a song like that will become popular. I mean, if you'd written that in the 1950s, you know, it would have been laughed at. You're writing, you know, Jimmy Crackhorn and I Don't Care. Uh, Tom Paxton or Tom, or Tom Lair, folk singers, are also, you know, very popular at the time. I think, you know, the point is young men especially have to confront Vietnam. So for them, these are, I think these are political things because they, they are facing a draft in ways, you know, that these are ways in, in the future, you know, we don't, we don't have these problems after that. Um, yeah. We are also facing our fathers across the dining room table. Yeah. Who were uh, the powers that be. You know? Yeah, and, and, and I think that's part of it, that, you know, that what starts at home becomes much larger than that. A culture which, or, or vice versa, you kind of transfer what's happening at home to what's happening in a larger sense, and then you can transfer the other way, too. You know, what, what Lyndon Johnson doing is part of what your father has helped create. And so I think it goes both ways, but in either way, you find the traditional fabric is being ripped apart, and you're peeking through and you're seeing stuff that you don't like. This is not what your teachers told you in school. You begin to think, hey, I've been lied to. You know, my teachers lied to me, my minister lied to me, my parents lied to me. You know, they told me to, to have faith in the system, to trust authority, and look what's happened. Yeah, I think was, how did they get that sewed up again? <laughs> uh, it's actually, I want to talk about that at the end because I think that's important. Um, there, the United States has a, certain segments of the U.S. have powerful ability to do that. And in fact, there's some new stuff, what you talked about earlier about commodification, and I always thought that that had begun in the late, late 70s and early 80s, the big chill and Rambo and all that kind of stuff to try to rewrite it. But in fact, that was occurring while the war was in progress. They begin, you know, a guy named Thomas Frank, who does a lot of stuff uh, on, um, on kind of the commodification. He has a book of essays called Commodify Your Descent. And another one on the Vietnam era called The Culture, the Culture of Cool. Is that it? The Conquest of Cool. The Conquest of Cool. Really talks about that. In the 1960s, they begin by taking rock songs that, you know, maybe implicitly, maybe explicitly, but in some way had a real strong political message and people heard them that way. And they use them for marketing. You know, bell bottoms initially started out as a political statement. I'm not going to dress in a gray flannel suit. The man in the gray flannel suit is the paradigm of the 50s, right? The company man, the organization man, all right? Sloan Coffin, people like that who are actually satirizing it. But that's kind of the paradigm of the 50s, the man in the gray flannel suit. Well, what could be more different than that than a bunch of bell wearing bell bottoms? Or, you know, at the end of hair, taking all your clothes off, right? That's even better. So uh, if I wear pants like that, if I dress differently than you, what I'm saying is I reject your culture. You, you, you created apartheid in the South. You're going to war in Vietnam. So I don't want to be like you, right? But what happens all of a sudden, what starts as a political statement, bell bottoms get sold for 85 bucks a, a pop on Madison Avenue, on, you know, on Fifth Avenue in New York at all these little boutique shops. And so a bunch of, you know, kind of... Uh, well-to-do people are wearing what began as, as a symbol of, of something beyond that. Whenever I talk about this, I, I have to think of uh, the famous uh, Leonard Bernstein uh, benefit for the Black Panthers, which Tom Wolfe, who I'm not terribly you know, uh, thrilled with in many ways, uh, really kind of nailed pretty good uh, in uh, what was it, Mau Mau and the Flat Catchers, or, ra or something, Black Power and Radical, the Radical Chic, uh, drawn a blank. But at any rate, Leonard Bernstein has a benefit for the Black Panthers in his Madison Avenue penthouse. And so it's, you know, wonderful. All these kind of very wealthy, upper crust Manhattan liberals are there with the Black Panthers. It's something like an Eddie Murphy skit would, you know, Eddie, Eddie Murphy actually did a spoof on this later. But, you know, all these people are there who are, you know, with all this revolutionary rhetoric with bandoliers on, and they're hitting up, uh, uh, you know, Madison Avenue liberals while they're sipping Chardonnay together. So. Um, you kind of see elements of that in it too, and, and it's just—it's just real easy that the, there's a, the system has a powerful uh, capacity to co-opt and commodify things. You see that in the music. Uh, I mean, even you know before even the structure you had, like I think I can't remember when Phil Oakes wrote the Talking Vietnam Blues, which, uh, again, uh, to my mind is the first I think explicit song about Vietnam that I can remember as I kind of look back and listen to as much of this as possible. Uh, you had, you know, kind of more general songs that kind of become anthemic, uh, Where Have All the Flowers Gone, uh, stuff like that. But I think of uh, Oaks' Talking Vietnam Blues, uh, Barry McGuire's Eve of Destruction, and after that, almost everything in some way could be tied to Vietnam. Uh, the most explicit, probably the anthem of the entire period, if there was one, was Country Joe and the Fishes. I feel like I'm, uh, I feel like I'm fixing to die rag, which kind of is a showstopper at Woodstock, which I actually want to mention Woodstock briefly, uh, uh, shortly. Um, other artists emerge out of this period without explicitly talking about the war, but clearly in many ways products of it. 
Uh, the best example in my mind is, is Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead. Um, when Garcia died, there were a ton of tributes to him, which often talked about his music and his lifestyle. But some of the more, I thought, compelling ones were people from the Bay Area who said that whenever there was a rally for the homeless, for the anti war movement, for anything, Garcia and the Dead were there. They were donating their time and money. They believed it. It wasn't some kind of scam for them. Uh, you know, the, the Dead used to have, a, you know, at their concerts, they would have a special section roped off for people to tape the show. You know, they didn't care. They encouraged bootleg, you know. So they were different. Uh, and of course, now they, they make ties. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so everybody in the end gets bought up. There, in fact, last year, somebody was asking me about this earlier, uh, the commodification and co-optation of the system, I keep a file on that. There are now Jerry Garcia beanie babies. <laughs> At some point, I, I, I may write something just on the, the way the 60s in Vietnam in particular has been remembered. So you have Jerry Garcia. Now, how do we know about him? Because he makes ties, and there's a beanie baby of, of Jerry Garcia. But, I mean, the Grateful Dead, you know, if you listen to the music, it's not political at all. I mean, it's, you know, not. But clearly, they were products of that, just like the Jefferson Airplane, it's, you know, what was. Uh, uh, the airplane isn't, you know, except for, well, actually, We Can Be Together has a, a, a political message to it. Um, song that... Uh, Actually, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young did, but, but uh, Paul Kantner wrote with them. It's kind of a holocaust, and there's only a few people left. Wooden ships. You know, actually, I mean, clearly, that, that's a, a song that has a, a, a political spike to it. No question about that. And not about the Vietnam War. Um, so you see that. I mean, I, you know, I kind of was like, uh, I'm, I'm going on a roll here, so I don't want to get carried away with it and talk about every song ever. I had a, a whole list of stuff I wanted to play. Actually, one of my favorites by a band that, a band, not a band, no one probably, have, well, very few people have ever heard of it, called The Last Poets. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, I call it proto-rap. Yeah, Gil Scott here and The Last Poets were kind of the, the intellectual godfathers of rap, and except for Chuck D, I've never heard anybody thank him or mention him. Uh, but uh, uh, Last Poets did a, did a rap called Ho Chi Minh. It's wonderful. We just could not win against Ho Chi Minh. And then they have this whole, it's the story of the Vietnam War. It's, it's a great history lesson, very explicit, tying the imperial struggle in Southeast Asia to civil rights and black, black nationalism in the United States. Uh, um, I mean, uh, who was it? The e uh, Eve of Destruction. No, um, the other one, by the Temptations, Ball of, Ball of Confusion, right? I mean, you would even have a mainstream Motown group who could get involved in this. It was safe, and I mean, I think that's the point you spoke to earlier. It becomes safe, right? Uh, I saw an interview with Barry Gordy once who was talking about um, Marvin Gaye. Uh, Gay started out, if you know anything about him, it's beautiful, you know, kind of a balladeer, beautiful love songs. And he comes to Barry Gordy with what would be, um, what's going on. And, I mean, it's, it's an amazing album, it's, you know, what's going on, um, Inner City Blues, Make Me Want to Holler, uh, Mercy, Mercy Me, it was a song about the environment. And Barry Gordy didn't want to record it. He said, look, this is, this is way out there, you know, it'll, it'll kill us, no one will buy this, and they'll think you've gone. And, you know, Marvin Gaye stood his ground and insisted it became just a, a massive bestseller. So when, you know, basically Motown balladeers can sing that, uh, didn't I think at one point the Supremes even kind of went out a bit on the edge and did something to that extent. It becomes mainstream. I mean, basically the war, or criticizing the war becomes so easily accepted, the counterculture becomes so much a part of American life that you can get away with this, which may have been its undoing. I mean, this is the real paradox, I think, that people opposing the system are, are, are trying to do more than simple reform always face. You know, as soon as you become popular enough, you tend to be commodified or co-opted. And you clearly see that. So, you know, I, first of all, I don't believe that music ever has the capacity to change things. There's a biography of um, John Lennon by a historian John Weiner called Come Together. And Weiner sees Lennon as, you know, a great revolutionary. I think, is it either Dave Marshall or Grill Marcus kind of thought Mick Jagger had this potential. And that's just way overstated as far as I'm concerned. I mean, these guys are singers. Somebody may or may not listen to them. They can write great music. but. You know, John Lennon wasn't going to bring the revolution on in the United States. So I'm not sure the capacity to do that is there in the first place. I doubt it is. But, but even more than that, they're, they're immediately mainstreamed. They're co-opted. You can hear them on the radio. Uh, you know, people go to their concerts to listen to music as much as anything else. So it's political. I, I think it really is, just as I think the entire counterculture was. But I also think that what it could actually accomplish was fairly limited. Having said that, I also think that culturally, the, the 60s lives on more than anything else. I think the greatest legacy of that period was actually culturally. There have been backlashes in many areas, civil rights, against the poor, in terms of foreign policy. But culturally, even though there have been attempted backlashes now, uh, uh, it's taken for granted that 
um, people will do drugs, even though, you know, in terms of political, you know, politically they're still a, a, a far out from it. I mean, Clinton wasn't killed by it. Uh, premarital sex is assumed. I mean, that's just taken for granted now. You know, they wouldn't even think of, you know, uh, uh, who was it, uh, Rockefeller in 64 had his campaign derailed because he had been divorced. No one would think, you know, no one really thinks Reagan was divorced, right? And he's the, the arbiter of the moral right, you know. So I think the greatest legacy actually comes from that period. Music. Music is clearly open uh, uh, to, uh, to new possibilities. You can say things and get away with things uh, that you wouldn't have before. Uh, yeah. Well, on that subject, Josephine, my loving darling mother, <laughs> KSHE in St. Louis, and they played um, Steppenwolf, and this was, um, I don't know, somewhere between 65 and 69. I'm not really sure. And he said, hell on the radio. <laughs> and that was it. Turn that radio off <laughs> immediately, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, they had, uh, for Elvis Presley, they thought he was a, a product of the devil, and they would have record burnings. You know, fundamentalist preachers would burn books and albums at the same time, right? You know, which, uh, you know, if you want to bring Britney Spears in the Backstreet Boys, I'm all for it. But, um, no, no, there's clearly a backlash against it, too. And, you know, I think a lot of old folks are just kind of throwing their hands up and saying, you know, God, what is it with this younger generation? What is it with these kids? So there's clearly both sides, you know, to that. Yeah. You talked about the convergence <clears throat> with the music and the, and, and the uh, attitude towards Vietnam. Remember that it had only been a few years before that when rock and roll came into being yeah. in the first place. And it was easy for all the young people to like it because our parents hated it so much. Yeah. So when it came, when the, when, when the war actually happened, rock and roll became, I don't even you say folk music came in after that, but rock and roll sort of led its way mm -hmm. into that. And, I, and another comment I wanted to make is uh, in Vietnam, it was a rock and roll war. We always think yeah. of it as that. And when you see movies now produced about that war, you can't have a movie without Creedence yeah. Clearwater in the mm -hmm. background. And even in Vietnam, the little things, because we brought that music with us over there, you had things like you would go to an officer's club and you would see a Vietnamese band singing war. What is it good for? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Complete takeoffs on everything that we did over here, which was, which was kind of ironic because they were all anti-war messages being sung in Vietnam yeah. by kind of what I would call almost in establishment places like officers clubs and everything else. Yeah. So the music never never became, while it was the message of what we all believed, I think it sort of got lost in the bigger picture of everything. It was just, it was just what it was. Yeah. Like a, I have this image of this Vietnamese group doing war, what is it good for, <laughs> in an officer's club. And, and James <laughs> Brown imitations, it was, it was really incredible. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, the doors were like the bar band of the Vietnam War, you know, because of, uh, uh, you know, Coppola using them in, in the, uh, the, Apocalypse. The, the most popular song you're talking about, uh, Country Joe and the Fish, and uh, and then the other one was Eric Burton's We Gotta Get Out of This yeah. Place If It's the right. Last Thing That We Ever right. Do. That was, those and again, were the two uh, no mention of Vietnam in that. It's an animal song. He also did, a, they did Sky Pilot later, right? Right. I mean, you know, anything could be kind of interpreted to having that kind of meaning. Uh, uh, one guy, uh, you know, whenever he hears in Agata de Vida, he has flashbacks, which, you know, because of Vietnam, because he just remembers hearing that so often there. <laughs> well, so do I. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this is a little ahead of schedule, but uh, uh, this, you know, I w when we get to Cambodia, which we may never get to, <laughs> at the rate we're going, <coughs> but at the, at, at the time of the Cambodian invasion yeah. is really when, you know, when Kent State happened, mm -hmm. and I was a freshman in college, we, uh, occupied the music building on campus and for three days and it turned into a giant sex drugs and rock and roll party i don't know actually about this just not not open sex particularly but open drugs and yeah. rock and roll and uh most fun i ever had i recommend <laughs> we go do it right now <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, uh, you see, if this show appears on <laughs> Friday night, there'll be Rick talking all of a sudden. You hear, e, you know, with that, you know, there was sign, a you know. there was a concert in uh, up in L.A. with um, check out this lineup: Country Joe and the Fish, Little Richard, Albert King, who was okay. a you know great blues singer, yeah. older singer, and uh, John Hammond, who was a younger white folk blues singer. 
And it was a, produced by Bill Graham at a place called the Olympic Auditorium, which is where they held the boxing matches in L.A. Now, while this concert was going on, you have to understand that the students in, at UCLA had completely blocked off the main freeway through L.A., 405. They'd occupied the freeway, and cars could not get through. Every campus in L.A. was in a complete uproar. You had this police chief in Los Angeles named Ed Davis, who is actually on tape talking about like the Chinese Navy massing outside Catalina Island or something like that. I mean, he was <laughs> flipping out. Yeah. And, and the, at this concert, when, when we got there, the, there was like 200 cops in riot gear with their helmets down lining the back of the, of the, uh, of the uh, hall. And uh, during John Hammond's set, uh, people kept getting busted for smoking pot. There were like plain clothes guys that were pulling people out. And the people up in the balconies started pelting the row of cops with like full cans of beer and pop. And they had these shields, you know, and so these, yeah. you just hear this like popping. You know, Albert King couldn't, couldn't go on. And, you know, the, you keep in mind, this is, everybody's thinking, what's going to happen when Country Joe gets on, right? So um, the, the guy from the, the promoter came out and said, everybody needs to calm down so we can keep the show going. Little Richard uh, came on stage. And he was like trying to make a comeback. And he had this song, I think it was called The Freedom Train or something like that. And he, everybody, he kind of led this caravan down through the crowd and then got a bunch of people back up on stage. So you got like a hundred hippies up there on stage dancing. Little Richard's on top of the piano. And all of a sudden, the stage collapses. And so all these pianos and speakers and everything are falling in. It's a miracle nobody got killed. But I read in the paper the next day that there was like out of like 2,000 people at the concert, there was like something like 400 arrests. And um, the Country Joe never came on. Lord only knows what would have happened. But, you know, I mean, if, if when I think if there was like one thing that, you know, one event that I was at that, that, that crystallized the connection of the counterculture to the anti-war movement, that was it and the way that the police reacted to it. Because, I mean, nobody was there to do a protest, but they were obviously, I mean, they, you know, just by their mere presence, you know, ver all came this close to provoking a riot. And for Ed Davis and Sam Yorty, that there was no difference. I mean, that was all part of the same process that, you know, communists inspired. I mean, LBJ was sure that communists were, you know, behind rock and roll. Uh, I mean, they, they were all tied together. You know, it was really funny because the whole time we were in that music building, I never really thought of getting arrested. I was worried about getting conked on the head or whatever, yeah. but I never really thought I was going to go to jail. But when I was at that concert, even though I, you know, I was not using drugs or anything, but I was like, I was envisioning, you know, Dad, I'm in jail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah. And, you know, if you, you can talk about film and theater, and you, you would have, you know, similar experiences in, in film, movies, which would not have been made earlier. I mean, there's a loosening, there are loosenings of obscenity laws anyway because of court decisions. But, again, I think Vietnam creates openings for things like The Wild Bunch of Bonnie and Clyde, which were, you know, at the time, the two most violent movies probably ever made, you know, mainstream movies ever made. Uh, and, you know, and again, these are, you know, not about Vietnam, but I think there's an opening. A society which sees scenes from the war is now willing to entertain something like Bonnie and Clyde or Wild Bunch. And then later you have uh, Catch-22 and MASH, which are Vietnam movies quite clearly. You know, they're about World War II and Korea, but those are, you know, you look at MASH and, you know, this absurd army, you know, incompetent. Uh, and, and, you you know, you obviously you're thinking, of, you're thinking about the war. Catch-22 and the military bureaucracy and everything else you're thinking about the war. Um, I don't want to, you know, ramble on forever and ever about this. The two things though, I do want to mention because... As a historian of this period, they really irritate me, or, or the way, or, or, or kind of the two maybe central uh, symbols of the 1960s counterculture: Hair and the Woodstock concert, the, the play Hair and the Woodstock concert. And they particularly rankle me the way we remember because if if you're at all familiar with them, these are clearly political anti-war events. Uh, Hair uh, uh, has one of the most powerful endings. Uh, you'll ever see when uh, George Berger, the hippie, uh, puts a uniform on to take to replace uh, uh, his friend uh, who's going to visit a girl, and he gets sent to Vietnam. And at the end, you know, in the movie, you see the gravestone with his name on it. It's clearly an anti-war uh, 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 message. I mean, a lot of the music in it talks about the war explicitly. Woodstock, 
three days of peace and love. It's, a, it's about ending the war. I mean, and again, Country Joe really kind of symbolizes the whole thing with I feel like I'm fixing to die. But afterward, what do you think when you talk about hair in Woodstock, what do you hear about? You know, hair, everybody takes their clothes off at the end of it. Woodstock, you know, drugs and peace and frolicking and everything else. And they've been denuded of their political impact. And this is how they have the power to do it. You know, all of a sudden, you know, hair is not a, an incredibly powerful any worse statement. It's about people taking their clothes off and running around naked. Woodstock, it's about people, you know, having, you know, sex in the field and getting stoned and all that kind of stuff. You know, and it loses the, the political impact it had. Um, we talked about commodification and co-optation, and, and Tom Frank's done some good stuff on this. And it's amazing because, you know, like I said, I had thought this had begun like in the Reagan years with the big chill and everything. But in the 60s, you start to see that where they're taking popular music, any war music, and they're using it to sell stuff. Madison Avenue immediately sees the popularity of this. Uh, you know, there, there, are commercial, there are ads which, you know, like join the Dodge Rebellion. Um, one of the ads, I forget what it was for, uh, you know, used the, the times there are changing. So you take this stuff, which has a clear edge to it, and all of a sudden it's very safe and calm now because you're using it to sell products. It's very pleasing, uh, which is why Frank calls the conquest of cool stuff that, you know, uh, was considered edgy or possibly oppositional is simply commodified. It's brought into the system, and this is one way to deal with these things. I mean, wasn't Grace Slick a, a Levi's model or something like that? Uh, I, think, I think she modeled jeans for Levi's, Grace Slick from the Jefferson Airplane. Uh, you know, very few cases where that doesn't happen. I mean, I think the Grateful Dead are, are really exceptional in that regard because they remain fairly true to their roots in ways that others didn't. Uh, so, you know, that's the power of the system. I think this is why uh, Vietnam and the 60s are remembered in a particular way. Uh, I mean, I just kind of froth when I see things like uh, Forrest Gump, which you know, I could spend the next hour and a half on and no one wants to hear that. Uh, the old show with Michael J. Fox in it where his parents were kind of silly hippies and nowadays you have like Darm and Greg, you know, which I've never seen and but I've, what's that? Tampax was there. That's right, the commercial, you know, Woodstock, Tampax was there, right. Uh, so, I mean, it's just so easily commodified now. Uh, um, and we lose, you know, you talk, how can you talk about the 60s and not mention Vietnam or civil rights? But they do it. That was, you know, 60s was about peace, love, and freedom, and hippies, and bell bottoms, and flowers, and you know, not, a, not a brutal, destructive war, not about, you know, civil rights struggle, brave people putting their lives on the line, literally. You don't, you know, you don't hear that. It's about Birkenstocks and dashikis and all this kind of stuff. So um, it's, you know, we could go on and on. I really don't want to do that just because we have to talk about Cambodia, among other things. <laughs> But I've also kind of left, left it fairly open. Does anybody have anything to say? Or actually, in this case, comments are better than questions since you guys, many of you know it way better than I do since you were there. <laughs> I just remember it as a kid. Basically, you know, the, the basic stay away from that. You know, when I was a young kid, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, it's like, you don't want to be like that. It was kind of, kind of threatening, very frightening to, to people of my parents' generation. Yeah. Uh, that, that's uh, illuminating to me because, like you, you know, we want, we wanted, we had pressure to stay away from that. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there was a division between what was considered moral and what was considered political. But throwing off the political yoke mm -hmm. is what really caused that kind of reaction. And it's a whole different view than morality and anti-morality. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, I think it does have a legacy that way, too, because, yeah. you know, Republicans have premarital sex, too, you know? Yeah. Uh, Republicans, some Republicans even allegedly smoke dope and snow court, snort coke, although not within the last 25 it's years. Still at least. <laughs> yeah. You don't snort coke, they snort cork. Snort That's what you said. I know, I know. That's yeah. Okay, that's not against the law. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, this is actually a cold, by the way, so I don't... <laughs> Yeah, I know. I just thought of that. Oh boy, there's going to be a lot of a lot of editing uh, uh, this week on the show, isn't there? Okay, you know, they'll have the little, you know, kind of the old music like you get at the theaters in between thirty-second breaks and so on and so forth. Okay, you, you, you know, I guess the thought about that you were the impact of of music and the significance of music, and when we think of things in terms of popular and mass culture here in the United States and and by popular and, and mass culture my thought is is those things that are are used by the majority of us and that 
and and not only used by the majority of us but embraced by by a majority of us and someone said also about the baby boom so that in sheer numbers mm -hmm. the numbers of us that were here in the 60s and um and and i guess my <clears throat> to talk out my thoughts is like why is the music significant as opposed to the humanity or lack thereof of the war or the civil rights civil rights struggles and i guess for one thing because again as a as a as an element of popular culture an entertainment element of popular culture it certainly is easier for us to embrace entertainment than it is to embrace the horrors of war um, or the horrors of apartheid or the um, or getting rid of those horrors I, mean, I also think it's you know you listen to a song that is critical of the war can be interpreted that way and it makes you feel like you're doing something and you know it's really kind of disturbing to see the the reality of of uh, a destructive situation in front of you and feel how you know com powerless and helpless but if you know singing a song makes you feel better then you know great i mean it's really i think it provides that function too another thing that uh, people have told me uh, have mentioned is that it was a actually a good a good way to communicate with people no matter where you were from regionally in terms of age in terms of class in terms of race you had this kind of common link you could, you know, get together and, you know, sir, veterans have, you know, told me this too, you know, you, it was a way to kind of meet somebody and know somebody, you listen to music together or something like that. And, um, I mean, it, you know, I'm sure it drove uh, the officer corps crazy that, you know, you have guys in the field listening to Country Joe or, or Eric Bird, and I mean, this is not, you know, the kind of morale they particularly wanted. Uh, you know, you think of like Good Morning Vietnam, where, you know, they're trying to get Robin Williams to play, you know, yeah, Sinatra and, you know, Ray Mercer and people like that, and they want to uh, some different. So, uh, again, uh, if I had, you know, I could have brought five or six songs in here and played it, and it would have been a lot. It would have been obvious. So uh, we can, we can uh, blame corporate America for that one, okay? I would have been cutting into their profits had I done that without authorization. We, we certainly don't want to do that because Sony could go under at any minute, you know. And, you know. Certainly don't want to take money away from, from Dylan, who's you know, probably just barely eking out right now. So. All right. Any, any last thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, my wife could lose her job. She works for Exxon. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'd never get over it. I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. So at any rate, that's that. Now let's get back to something I feel a lot more comfortable with, which is the Tet Offensive. When we last left Vietnam three or four weeks ago, uh, William Westmoreland had just... Uh, come back uh, and uh, announced before Congress that, you know, there were still problems. The war wasn't, you know, going to end that soon. But within a couple years, we'll start to bring troops home. And there is, in his utter, utterly memorable words, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, in early 1968, the joke went, the light at the end of the tunnel was a train. And it was headed right at Westy. Um, the definitive event of the Vietnam era uh, occurs in January 1968, uh, the Tet Offensive, right? And there were others who will say, no, it was this, that, or they think they're wrong, it's Tet, okay? Uh, Tet didn't end the war. The war will go on for another five years, but Tet ended American hopes that they would succeed in Vietnam. And after Tet, basically, it's a way to find a decent interval and to as you pointed out in the post a long time ago, quoting that Air Force uh, report, a CIA analyst talking about the air war, uh, after Ted, it's basically a way to destroy Vietnam to make uh, uh, recovery impossible, uh, very difficult at least. Right? But Ted really does create a whole different set of circumstances. Um, I don't want to spend a great deal of time on this because I think our readings cover it fairly well. There's a chapter in my book on the Ted Offensive in Masters of War. Uh, couple articles on the economic impact of the war in the reader and Neil Vin Long's article which I think is just terrific yeah, in the reader Marilyn Young goes over it in her book so there's plenty that we've read about the Tet Offensive so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time about it which is why I'm just gonna you know kind of go through this very brief list of things give a, a real snapshot of it but make sure that you do all the readings to to get the full flavor of this because it's very important it's 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 quite critical um, the attack itself occurred 
uh, when Americans were fairly optimistic that things in Vietnam were going well. I mean, Westmoreland's uh, you know, pronouncement, there's light at the end of the tunnel, had stuck. And in fact, LBJ's popularity was quite high. Majority of Americans supported the war. I think I've said this before, Vietnam, if you look at it in terms of sheer numbers and Gallup polls, was actually one of America's more popular wars, except for World War II. Most Americans consistently supported the war in Vietnam. And uh, that held true in 1967. In late 67, there's a general sense of optimism. Things seemed to be going well. The media, which would later be blamed for Vietnam, actually was reporting the government's side of things with, with pretty much without diversion, basically. You know, if the government said it, that was kind of the way the news was portrayed. There were tons of people in the streets, but by and large, the media did a good job of saying there are a bunch of hippies, there are a bunch of dope heads, and so on and so forth. And uh, the movement tended to be student-oriented. And of course, Chicago in 68 later would just be a debacle, even though this occurs after 67. So uh, um, by and large, the anti-war movement, though it was something politicians were concerned about, wasn't a threat. So things looked pretty good in late 1967. Now, in the few months prior to that, uh, Army intelligence, MACV intelligence, has some indications that infiltration is increasing into the South. But there's a debate going on as to whether the numbers jibe or not, because uh, the real issue, as I've said before, is who is included in the order of battle. Um, a lot of, for example, funeral processions are taking place where you'll have hundreds of people carrying caskets. It's a war. You know, thousands are being killed daily. Well, nothing unusual about that, is it? Later on, they would find out that in many cases these were VC, and the caskets were full of weapons. Right? So in, in MACV headquarters in Saigon, there is a debate going on as to infiltration numbers. Later on, people would claim that Westmoreland had clear indications that infiltration had dramatically risen, and he should have known this and anticipated something, but he deliberately suppressed that information because he didn't want LBJ to think badly of him because he had just said there's light at the end of the tunnel. I, I don't really subscribe to that. Clearly, the numbers were going up. How much? No one's really sure. How many of these people were actually VC? How many actually fought? Still open to debate. But clearly, something's going on. There's something happening, right? In mid-January, in mid-January, up here, it can't be, it's not on the map, up north, near the Laotian border. I can't believe it's on the map. <laughs> uh, uh, at a place called Quezon. At a place called Quezon, which is in the north, it's kind of a, around, around here. Um, is that an O? No, S-A-N-H. K-H-E-S-A-N-H. Up in the north at a place called Quezon, which is not far from the DMZ near the Laotian border. Um, it's a place actually where uh, uh, strategically it was not terribly useful. It was not an area where American troops really had to be. But at any rate, uh, Pavan troops, General Jap, attack an American installation at Quezon. Right? Strategically, Quezon doesn't have a whole lot of value. And had the United States abandoned Quezon, let the Pavan overrun it, probably wouldn't have no one would have heard, you know, it would have lasted about a week and no one would have ever heard about it again. But LBJ thinks that Quezon is Dien Bien Phu. This is immediately, they're trying to pull another Dien Bien Phu on us. He has an a, uh, intricately scaled model of Quezon built in the White House war room. And he decides that, that he will make a stand at Quezon. They're not going to make a Dien Bien Phu out of this. Uh, by Within a month, over half of all American troops in Vietnam are in I Corps. They're in the north because he will not lose Quezon. Right? Quezon was a ruse. It was an attempt which succeeded perfectly to draw as many Americans up north as possible. Okay? In the meantime, the VC are massing throughout the south. Uh, in late January, they're preparing for the Tet ceasefire. Tet is uh, the Asian New Year, celebrated throughout Asia, and it's uh, apparently the, the biggest celebration, kind of like the 4th of July and Christmas all rolled into one. And traditionally, there had been truces during Tad, just as there are ceasefires at Christmas time and things like that in wars. And by and large, you know, occasionally there'd be sniping and whatnot, but by and large, the truce is held. All right? A few days before Tad, 1968, uh, uh, General Fred Wyand, who's one of Westmoreland's deputies, 
who was commanding uh, troops kind of over here near the Cambodian border, senses that something weird is happening. And he's trying to get through to Westmoreland. Westmoreland doesn't get it or doesn't want to listen to Wyand or whatever. So Wyand pulls, I think, two divisions, I could be wrong about the number, back towards Saigon. Right? And later on, this is going to be important because it essentially saves, saves Saigon. Uh, uh, the, on the evening of the 29th, 30th, uh, 29th and 30th of January, the Tet Offensive begins. The Viet Cong, National Liberation Front, Pavin, break the truce and they attack. Um, a few units up north essentially jumped the gun by about six to eight hours. So word got back to Saigon, to MACV headquarters, that something was going on. They still weren't sure what. Uh, by the later that evening, uh, a concerted attack throughout all of South Vietnam, 17th parallel down, had begun. In the end, basically everything that had any political, economics, or military importance in South Vietnam had been hit. It was a massive attack. It was not terribly well coordinated. I mean, many units jumped the gun, which kind of sent a signal. Had Wyand not withdrawn, Saigon very well might have fallen. The VC were strongest actually in the Delta and in the Saigon area. All right. And during the Tet Offensive, they actually, uh, VC sappers actually invaded the U.S. Embassy. There are famous uh, photos of this. They blew a hole in the wall of the embassy and actually invaded the embassy ground. They were all killed. Uh, there's a, a famous scene, I think it's Mike Wallace, interviewing American soldiers on the embassy grounds defending the U.S. Embassy, the, ambassador, uh, the ambassador's residence. Uh, and you see this throughout. Vietnam throughout the South, yeah. What's a sapper? Uh, I can explain it, but not as well as you can. And uh, I'm willing to defer. A sapper is a uh, is a gorilla carrying a dynamite charge, mm -hmm. um, and they set it off with either uh, what they call C4, like C4, which is a plastic explosive, or with a uh, an electrical charge, and you penetrate, say, underneath the fence. You set this charge down, it blows up the fence, or in this case, it blew up buildings, rooms, and it's usually a suicide mission. Usually, you try to, you, you try to get out, but typically, it's a suicide mission. I always call them kamikaze engineers, because <laughs> they actually have to have some expertise at, you know, have explosives and, uh, you know, basic chemistry of, of uh, weaponry and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, uh, and in fact, many of them didn't die in the process so they actually invaded the grounds. Um, scenes of this are shown on TV uh, and this is occurring. I mean the embassy was kind of the symbolically you know the embassy is being invaded you know uh, and scenes like this are occurring throughout all of uh, uh, southern Vietnam where um, military installations are being hit, uh, city halls, uh, village you know village headquarters, uh, uh, American bases throughout Vietnam uh, are, are being hit. Hmm? Radio, stations. Radio stations, everything. I mean, everything that had any type of importance in warfare is coming under attack. Uh, something like 242 cities, every province, every district has some kind of offensive taking place in it. Right? Uh, now, Westmoreland, in late November, what is it, 10 weeks before that, had basically said there's light at the end of the tunnel. And this had been the official story throughout that period. Things are going well. Yeah, the war's not over yet, but we have them on the run. We're about to turn the corner. All of a sudden, boom, you see Viet Cong on the embassy grounds. You see this massive offensive. And we can talk a bit later as to what, you know, whether it was a victory, whether it was a defeat, what it actually meant. We can disagree on that. But the fact of the matter is, at a certain level, it doesn't matter. Because the fact that the Viet Cong were able to pull this off indicated that you know, Westmoreland's uh, official story from November was, you know, was, was not the case. And this is really where you start to see, as much as anything, a real awakening by mainstream America, not just hippies and anti-war people, but by mainstream America, that somebody wasn't being straight. Somebody was kind of giving them a story. If, in fact, the light was at the end of the tunnel, the Viet Cong should have never been able to pull this off. And they clearly did so. Whether it succeeded or not, we can discuss later. Yeah. Didn't the Americans actually uh, purposefully dismiss critical intelligence about well, something yeah, afoot, um, other than Quezon? Westmoreland himself would later say that this is the biggest intelligence failure 
you know, since Pearl Harbor and the Battle of the Bulge, it ranks up there with that. There's a book by James Words called T The Tet Offensive Intelligence Failure in War. The problem wasn't that there wasn't enough intelligence. In fact, there were reams of intelligence, you know. The problem was in, you know, kind of figuring out what it all meant, and they really botched that. They discounted some signs, which they probably should have not discounted, obviously, and took other things seriously. You know, you, you, it's, a, it's a consumer thing in many ways. Intelligence, you know, you're, it's for consumption. And you kind of know what people want. And so there's a tendency, I think, whether it be something you do consciously or unwittingly, to give people what they want to hear. And I mean, this is, becomes the crux of the case. Westmoreland didn't want intelligence, which indicated massive infiltration, which in indicated that a, a major uprising was about to occur. Right? On the other hand, why would he? I mean, to kind of turn him into a scapegoat, uh, I, I think, is you know, ahistorical. Generally, you know, you know what LBJ wants to hear. Yeah, I, I guess I was thinking that maybe that, in, that is an indication of to what extent folks like Westmoreland wanted a conventional style confrontation, which would have been provided at Quezon. Yeah. You know, rather than facing up to this wide scale infiltration, you can do little about oh, it. Oh, absolutely. And they love, I mean, in that sense, they like Quezon because they could just send more troops up to Quezon. You could, you know, air attacks. I mean, it's fairly easy to figure out how to, how to deal with Quezon. All right. Right. And the infiltration, the numbers, the infiltration from the south coming in. It's a different, it's a different horse, you know, and Wyand actually gets it. I mean, again, you know, this is a historical, you know, it, but if Wyand hadn't pulled back, clearly Saigon would have been at much greater risk. I think that's fair to say. Um, politically, Tet has a huge impact. Later on, um, the basic line would be that the Viet Cong were wiped out during Tet. And that, in fact, it was a great American military victory. But politically, it was a huge defeat because of the way it was presented, uh, in large measure because Westmoreland had promised light at the end of the tunnel, and that clearly wasn't the case. And in large measure because the media had exaggerated. The best example of this is a two-volume book uh, by Peter Braystrup, uh, which, to my great embarrassment, uh, the title of which has just escaped me. Um, yeah. Is it Big nice story. Big story, yeah. Big story, yes. Thank God I, I recovered on that one. Uh, but it's two volumes, and basically, uh, you know, you tell, you know, in, in the end, it's, it's almost as simple as blaming Walter Cronkite for losing the war. Cronkite goes on TV at the end of February and says, look, Cronkite always supported the war. He's most, you know, Cronkite's kind of the most popular media man in America. He's kind of a, a Bill Cosby, Oprah Winfrey figure. You know, people actually listen to him. You know, there's really no one in the media to compare with him anymore. Uh, and Cronkite even says, look, it's, it's time that we admit we did our best, but we have to get out of this thing. We have to... Uh, you know, leave not as victors, but as a noble people who did their best and failed or something like that. So afterward, there was this kind of sense that, you know, the media cheated us. They, they stole this one away from us. It in fact, was a great victory. And if they had just reported it that way, um, you know, all would have been well. Uh, in fact, you know, if, if you read, if you've already read or, or you should read, uh, the stuff by Neil Vin Long and then my chapter in, in, in Masters, you're going to see a quite different story. On one hand, what I found was that the American military people in Saigon, throughout Vietnam actually, and in Washington, saw this in, in fairly bleak terms. They did not see a great victory at the time. Now, five years later, they can say, well, you know, it was a great victory. That doesn't matter. You weren't making policy in 1973. You were making it in 1968. And in 68, the basic line was, uh-oh, the stuff's hit the fan. This is a different ballgame. And Westmoreland says, this, we're in a whole new ballgame now. Harold K. Johnson, the Army Chief of Staff, says, uh, we have suffered a defeat. There's no doubt about it. And this is the general line. Earl Wheeler goes to Vietnam in late February. He spends February 23rd to 27th. As I said, he gets off at the airport. I think it was at Tonson Nut. And he's shot at the VC or, you know, the, 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 the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff arrives at an American base and the VC are shooting at him on base. I mean, that says something, I think. Uh, people would later joke it's the first time Earl Wheeler ever, you know, saw a shot fired in anger. He'd never, he'd, he had no combat experience. Uh, Wheeler comes back. Read his report. It's incredibly bleak. You know, this long report, which, you know, basically says, uh, uh, his conclusion is, quote, in short, it was a very near thing. We almost lost the whole thing. Now, later on, people would say, oh, it was a great military victory. Read Neil Vin Long. In fact, Neil Vin Long, who's a Vietnamese scholar in the United States, who has contacts both on both sides of the 17th parallel at the time, uh, shows that during the initial Tet attacks in February of 1968, Viet Cong losses were not that great, that, in fact, they were able to rally, retreat, recover quite well. There were two later TETs. They were called mini TETs, TET 2 and TET 3. In May and August, those were disastrous for the Viet Cong. They had not had time to regroup or rally. 
they went back into action too soon and they took huge casualties in May and August and then Operation Phoenix comes in and the VC is badly hurt by 1968, late 68, early 69. Neil Vinlong also believes they recovered fairly quickly and within a year and a half, two years, they were basically back to their pre-tet strength. Okay. Uh, I think this, if, if Neil Vinlong is correct and he's terribly sharp, this changes our entire thought about TAT. I mean, it really does, I think, seriously undermine the whole idea that it was a great military victory, psychological defeat. That connected with the way the American military people saw it at the time, I think really blows some fairly significant holes in this whole idea. I mean, TAT, any way you cut it was bad news. I would argue it was disastrous. Yeah. Who, who pulled back out of Saigon? You, you used a, an oh, initial. General Fred Wyand, W-E-Y-A-N-D. He was a uh, I don't want to go into again. Uh, there were uh, field forces in Vietnam. There were, I think, four FFVs, Field Force Vietnam. There were commanders. They basically, it was, a, it, they were the Army. It, these were Army officials. The Marines had uh, their own um, organization up in the north. Uh, the Marines in Vietnam were fighting under the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force, 3 MAF. The Army had field forces, and there were, I believe, four field forces in Vietnam. Uh, Fred Wine was the commander, I think, of uh, the second field force. I could be wrong about that. Bruce Palmer was, a, I think, a field force commander. They're basically Westmoreland's deputies. They're the army commanders uh, in MACV. And Wyan was pretty sharp. He had a fairly strong reputation. Westmoreland was not considered the brightest bulb in the package, to be quite honest. I mean, he's not, not the sharpest tool in the shed, you know, whatever. He's all kinds of fun metaphors, right? Um, why and actually pulled back. Uh, my, the point there I'm making is that there were people who saw something going on and there, there was intelligence. I mean, uh, the best example of this was a guy named Sam Adams who was a CIA official in Vietnam who later, uh, later wrote a book called The Numbers Game and Adams actually was the uh, Mike uh, Wallace's main source for the CBS documentary which would later be the, the reason for the court case, the CBS documentary which claimed that Westmoreland purposely fudged the numbers uh, because he didn't want LBJ to know how bad things were. So, yeah. You, you mean he pulled back from being out in the field to defend Saigon? He was, yes, yes. He was near the Cambodian border and withdrew, I think, two divisions, pulled them back towards Saigon. And apparently they, they you know, really were able to withstand a, a, a lot of the VC attack at the, uh, on the city itself. Yeah. Were most of our Marines in Vietnam during Tet? Yeah, but they were up north. They're, they're, they're you know, in, in I Corps. So this is an army thing in the south, yeah. I mean, in Tet, I mean, Tet's really important in the south, in the Delta, in the Mekong region, and, and in the Saigon region, which is where, I mean, the VC was the strongest there. What does that say? This is the capital. This is the most populated area. This is where the vast majority of the population lives, and this is where the enemy is the strongest, okay? Uh, one of the great ironies is that the one service which believed that the U.S. had to fight the war differently, had to take the insurgency seriously, was the Marine Corps. And where are they? They're fighting a conventional war in the north. This is where they actually have to fight the Pavan because they're right there along the DMZ and I Corps. So, I mean, it's kind of all ba backwards. Um, uh, and so when, when Tet occurs, I mean, the Mekong region and Saigon are already fairly red on the maps, as you pointed out. I mean, this is not a, a war which you can identify by territory lost or gained. You have these battles lost again you have these maps which kind of sh have colors to indicate village control you know what's that mean body count I mean yeah during Ted clearly the enemy lost more people than the US did there's no question about that uh, I don't know what the numbers are I think 40,000 they're suggesting that it was 40,000 the first week I think those are too high I think Yo Vin Long suggests they're too high too clearly they lost more I mean, the United States however lost two over 2,000 the biggest casualty week throughout the entire war for the United States was Ted week they lost I think 2,100 dead that week, right? The United States, can, as Victor Krulak and, and Harold K. Johnson has pointed out, the U.S. can afford to lose 2,100, a lot, lot less than the enemy can afford to lose 20,000. 20,000 for, for the enemy is not catastrophic. Over 2,000 for the U.S. is, is stunning. It's, it's huge. Oh. The other significant thing about some of those 2,000 that were killed during that week was that there were... Um, You'll understand this term "remps." There were people mm -hmm. in the, um, <laughs> yeah. in in the uh, in the, that were clerks that had never fired a gun before in 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 in, uh, in, in anger, that were brought into battles because mm -hmm. they had to be, like yeah. in Saigon, like in Da Nang, um, somewhat in Pleiku. 
and I think, and that's probably the only time during the war that there were a whole lot of people in the rear echelons that were killed. And I think that's what brought a lot of this home too, is that now all of a sudden people that were not in, that were not combat trained yeah. were fighting. And yeah, I mean, even among combat troops in Vietnam, a majority did not actually engage in battle, even among combat troops. When you take the U.S. Army as a whole, it was only about 10% of people actually saw combat. Ramps are rear echelon MFs. And yeah, you're right, these guys are clerks and typists and you know, bartenders and things like that. And all of a sudden, Tet has occurred, you know, well, first of all, there's a truce fire. So a lot of the Arvin are, are on vacation. They're heading back to see their families and the villages or whatnot. And there's a terrible desertion problem. A lot of them simply don't come back. Uh, despite claims that the Arvin fought, you know, tremendously. In fact, uh, Wheeler said that, you know, the d desertion rates were huge. The average uh, uh, Arvin unit was really at, you know, 40 to 50 percent uh, uh, staffing at that time. So um, Tet really exposes a lot of the problems, pacification, the Arvin, uh, uh, America's inability to deal with insurgency, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get back.